Mozart, I, if you don't know, is an incredibly interesting character. But how, how staggering is that as a fact? Apparently, his music helps ripen fruit. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Two in a Bar. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. And today, we are diving into another piece of classical music. What are we doing today, Joe? This is yours. It is very much mine. So before we dive into that, Chris, I want to ask you a question. Go on. Okay, so what do Assassin's Creed, Salman Rushdie, and Mozart all have in common? Genuinely no idea. You haven't got a clue, have you? You haven't got a clue because the answer is, and I'm going to say this wrong, I think it might be pronounced the Janissary, or maybe Janissary, battalion of the Turkish military. Right. So if you haven't worked it out by now, Turkish, Mozart, the piece we're looking at is, of course, Rondo Alaturka. Nice, nice. Also, thank you. Also known as Piano Sonata Number no. Eleven by Mozart, inspired by a Turkish march. Um, this sounds great. So, what order are you going to talk about things? Because if you say now, I can put it in the timestamps in the description on YouTube, and then people can jump ahead if there's a bit they're particularly interested in. So, what are you talking about? Well, let's talk about the actual piece itself, like when it was written and its structure. Mm -hmm. Um, Then we can move on to a few things about why it's Alaturka, things like that, the history linked into that. And then I think we need to talk a little bit about Wolfgang himself, interesting man that he is. In fact, um, and then any other pieces that you talk about, uh, and this piece as well, I'll put links to those in the description as well, so you can check those out. And if you're new to this format, this is basically where we take it in turns to tell each other about a famous piece of music. And this is Joe's turn to educate me. Uh, both going to sit back with a beer. You got a beer? I've got a beer, yeah. I've come all Excellent. the way, Chris, to see you, haven't I? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later. So Mozart... <laughs> So Mozart, Rondo and Turka, so this was written in 1784, or at least published in 1784. People aren't exactly sure when it was written. And the Alaturka is the third movement, as I said, of Piano Sonata number, number 11. Um, you'll probably know, it's only the first movement, because um, the first movement is one that goes, shall I sing it to them? I think people probably deserve it, don't they? That's why they're here. What I will explain, Chris, is that you're making me sing this again because I was doing it in the wrong key. <laughs> and you were you weren't happy. So now I've got to go la da 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 na da 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 Um I won't do any more. So you've got you've got a very good ear and you know you would hundred percent pick me up on that if I was doing it wrong. So yeah, the point no, it doesn't matter because fair. I want it to be in a comfortable range for me, which that clearly isn't, and it's <laughs> slowly starting to ruin the piece for people. That's the lovely first movement, okay? The Alaturka itself is the third movement. It is the Rondo, hence the name, Rondo Alaturka. Um, Chris, mm-hmm. what's the structure of a Rondo, in case people don't know? Because I'd, I'd like to test you on this, Masters well, of Music. I always like to explain a Rondo as a bit like a, a club sandwich. So you've got your bread, some mm-hmm. kind of filling, bread, a different filling, mm-hmm. bread, and then if you wanted, you could add yet more fillings and more bread. But the key, Joe, is that the bread has got to be the same kind of bread each time. It's infinite, isn't it, sounds. though? It could, it could be infinite. Yeah, you pick, you pick your bread at the start, you know, your brown bread, your white bread, whatever, and then you go down, keep it the same, and it could go on forever. Lovely. I think it's a great way of describing it. A cl- the club sandwich had a turka, you know, kebab. Um, so <laughs> that is as we say, what a rondo is. So this is the very famous rondo, which goes, that would do. That's the main theme for the rondo, okay? Now, the point about, Chris, the 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 janissary or the janissary from Turkey is that this is supposed to imitate a janissary band because at the time, the Turks were the only ones to have a real sort of military band, as it were. Oh, okay. And it, yeah, and it became quite popular over Europe, as I understand it. Now, if, like me, Chris, you're slightly clued into history, you might be wondering what that's about, because, of course, Turkey didn't really exist at the time, did it? Um, honestly, I would say, along with textiles, history was my worst subject at school, which, which is a shame because uh, my mum did history at uni, keen interest <laughs> in history, but yeah. that didn't pass on, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe we're um, skipping generation. So- 
so no, I don't know about that. I also don't know anything about this piece. Obviously, really, really famous piece, great piece. Played it a lot of times. Have you I don't played know it a lot anything of times? About it. For um, sure, but but I, I I don't know anything about it. Don't know why it's called Alaturka Turkish March. So really looking forward to finding out why. Well, look now this this is why because although Turkey didn't exist as a country at the time because it was part of the Ottoman Empire, of course. Um, okay. What it was, they had this this military section, like I say, called the called the Janissary. I'm going to call them Janissary, and people can pick me up on it later. And they used to have these military bands, and that's what it was an imitation of. I didn't realise there were quite a few pieces done in the style of a Turkish march, which is what Alaturka is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a march. Um, Beethoven did one, for example. Um, I think Schubert might have done as well. I can't remember now. So it was... It was the Schubert's um, um, March Militaire, Military March. I'm not sure. It sounds Turkish. I mean, it sounds French, the way you're saying it, so... With um, but it was definitely in vogue, and um, so people thought it was a good idea to to write in that way. So that's where it gets its name. That's what it's all about. It is in a march style. Um, in terms of the piece itself, Chris, like you said, it's a rondo, so it keeps going back to its original theme and keeps developing. I think the the other section which people know a lot about or will recognise is, is the bit in the major. Um, so this is your chance to sing. Would you like to sing the bit in the major? You know I've not been blessed with a with a fine voice, but etc. Yeah, exactly. Not particularly long, but a very very pretty piece. I'm sure you'll agree. And like I say, very much in vogue in terms of in the start of the march. Mozart gave it the name Alaturka himself, which I think is actually quite unusual because normally with things like this, it gets named afterwards by other people, as is yeah. my understanding of it. Chris, if people wanted to hear a shortened version with the themes, you know, maybe to dance to, where could they find that? Uh, I feel like you're leading on nicely to um, something we'll come back to at the end, which is my uh, dance music remix of this. Fantastic. Okay. That'll be linked. So check that out. Very, very good. What you didn't know, Chris, when you're remixing this, is more about the the industry themselves. Now, I think this is very, very interesting, Okay. So, like I said, they were a military order, a Turkish military order, and it turns out they were a bit, uh, a bit rogue with some things. Um, a bit rogue, so a bit off the cuff. Yeah, they weren't particularly nice about some things. So case in point is when, um, I think it's Sultan Osman II, according to my research, when he tried to discipline them because he thought they were a bit too powerful, can you guess what they did to him? It wasn't nice. It, it wasn't the best. Because they decided that what the Duke just did is execute him, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire himself, and that was enough. But that's the sort of thing they did. Okay, not particularly, um, not particularly nice uh, people. To come back to my earlier point, by the way, about Assassin's Creed and Salman Rushdie. Okay, mm-hmm. I'll explain who who Salman Rushdie is in a minute for you. Um, Assassin's Creed, Chris, is is the famed computer game, as you all know, I'm sure, and film based on the game. Absolutely, yeah. Um, where they said it in all, all different places. One of them is based, I think, on the Yanisri. Okay. Um, and then Salman Rushdie um, writes about them in his book, The Enchantress of Florence. So that's a little bit about them, which um, I thought was very, very interesting. And interesting how, you know, despite the way they were, they had a heavy influence at the time on, on Western music. As I say, Ronda Alaturka published in 1784, which would have made Mozart how old, Chris? Um, he was born in 56, right? I believe so. Uh, and then... So, 18. Um, so, a few facts about Mozart. As you pointed out, he's incredibly young when he writes this, and that's obviously a theme of his life, if you didn't know it already. Um, how old was he, Chris, when he wrote his his first piece? Do you know? Um, off the top of my head, I, I couldn't tell exactly how old he is, but he was a child prodigy, right? So, he was... <laughs> Very, yeah. very gifted at the piano, and his dad made him tour Europe, which I'm sure you're going to get onto in a minute. But he mm. was uh, touted around Europe as a child pianist and composer, right? So it's probably like, I don't know, something stupid like three or four, right? Yeah, so the, the jury's still out on it a bit, but they think either sort of three, four, maybe five, but probably probably three or four years old. Um, needed his dad's help, didn't he? Do you know what he needed his dad dad's help for? No. Holding the pencil. Not for the music. So you wow. couldn't hold the pencil properly. So Leopold, yeah. father, you know, just helping him grip the pencil so he could write his first piece for violin and piano. 
obviously quite incredible. So would you like to hear some more facts about Mozart? Always. Mozart, I, if you don't know, is an incredibly interesting character, um, not least because of his music, but also I think the way he wrote his music, the way he physically wrote it. Um, and th- this is sort of made a fuss of in in, um, in the play Amadeus, isn't it? Where um, one of the one of the characters, Salieri, is a composer. He looks at Mozart's manuscripts, and do you know what he do? You know what he sees, Chris. What does he see? Uh, or, or perhaps it's better to say what he doesn't see. No idea. I can't, I can't remember. I've seen the film, but I can't remember this. He doesn't see any crossings out. He doesn't see any crossings out. It's there, and it's just done perfectly. It's like the it's like the notes have just fallen out of his brain onto the page, and this is something that you know a lot of composers did not actually do. So Beethoven was famous, wasn't he, for revising his pieces yeah, a lot, yeah. crossing them out the whole time. Lots of different sketches of his work. Mozart knew what he wanted to write and just wrote it down, which I always think is amazing. Obviously, an incredible mind with that. Yeah, well, yeah. didn't he just compose it all in his head, like entirely, like finish the whole thing in his head before he picked up a pen, paper, pencil, whatever they wrote with, and then, and then wrote it all down perfectly from his head. Yeah, which is, which is incredible, right? That The idea of that sounds like crazy. I don't know how much yeah. he did it sort of at, at, at a keyboard in terms of you know, the harpsichord or whatever he would have been using at the time, which is a specific one, but just to have that there already I think is amazing and hear it like yeah. that um particularly from a from a, a young age a uh, massive pet lover might start which makes him go up even higher in my estimation oh, yeah 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 he had um some cats dogs he also had I thought they were going to say when I was researching this I thought it was going to be quite exotic animals it was just like a horse as well which you know I don't own a horse but I think that's probably pretty standard I, well, I thought it was going to be something a little bit more Maybe tropical animal, you know, like a snake. <laughs> but no, no, exactly. Lucky not. Mozart boosting intelligence of children. Have you heard about this, Chris? I've not heard about this, but but I've heard the phrase Mozart for babies thrown around mm. a lot. Apparently it's a bit of a myth. Apparently yeah. it's a bit of a myth. There was some research done that listening to some Mozart sonatas might in- improve sort of spatial awareness and things like that. They're now not quite sure if it does... Personally, I think listening to Mozart helps people in many ways. You know, go listen to him, but don't expect your children to become geniuses because of it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. I ask you, mm. you've got a young child. Have you been do. playing Mozart to him? He's been playing it himself because he has a book which has you know, buttons to press. And one, oh, of, yeah. one of the things is the opening movement of Rondo alla Turca. Not Rondo alla Turca, because that's the final, you know, Sonata 11. And it drives me insane. <laughs> Yeah, I took the batteries out, so you know you can press the button all you want, but it's not going to play. He's had enough Mozart. He'll be, you know, if he, if he is intelligent, it won't be because of that, Chris. Let me tell you, okay. Um, <laughs> a little bit more about Mozart, by the way. This is a little bit on the whole boosting intelligence front. Apparently, his music helps ripen fruit. Sorry, can we? Can we? <laughs> so, you is know, there any scientific evidence for this? You know, you know when you go to the shop and you buy, um, you know, an avocado, yeah, sure, sure, and it's and it's not quite ripe, and you think, oh, and you, I wanted that for my sandwich, right. yeah. You know, you, we've all been there. Um, apparently, playing Mozart to music helps ripen fruit. There's been, uh, I think, this is just circumstantial evidence of people, you know, who pick fruit or whatever, leave it out to to help ripen, ripen, play Mozart's music to it, and it ripens more quickly do you think do you think that's true i'm skeptical if i'm honest <laughs> so are they, are they are they playing it off a recording are they sitting it on the piano and actually you know giving it a live performance that could be a career couldn't it so if there there's anyone out there you know a, a budding young pianist who wants a little bit of work okay get yourself get yourself down to the local fruit processing plant whatever that is if that exists you know get your piano there play Play, play my cake, you get yourself to the orchard. Be, ra- be raining apples there in no time. <laughs> um, That's ridiculous. To, I know, I like that though. I thought that was quite cool. Mozart was also a Freemason. You know, anyone who's anyone in that time seemed to be a Freemason, right? I, I knew about that because I've conducted one of his overtures recently to the Magic Flute and it has a motif all the way through that's supposed to resemble the certain knock that they have on the door for Freemasons' lodges, allegedly. Ah, oh, that's not very well concealed then, is it? 
giving away trade secrets. Um, uh-huh. He could also speak 15 languages. 15? 15. Now, Chris, as a man who's fluent in French, you must be quite impressed by the fact that he wasn't just fluent in, in two languages like you, but 15. <laughs> Fluent in French. We're um, <laughs> hoping to go to Paris um, shortly. Beautiful. And it's now quite a number of years since I did A-level French and genuinely worried about how little I can remember of it. You must be very excited. Just down to basics. You know. Yeah, go what, what, what was 15 languages then? Because so he's um, from Austria. Yeah. He was born in Salzburg. I can't remember mm. if you mentioned that or not. I haven't, I um, haven't mentioned it, which is a shame because I've been to his birthplace. Oh, birth likewise, house. Likewise. Yeah. 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 Nice. And that lovely town, Salzburg. If you get a chance to go, definitely go. Wonderful. Sound and music as well, you know? So obviously obviously German mm-hmm. is his main language. Um he certainly worked in Paris for no, he lived in Paris and he did live in Paris. Sorry, people I'm, think I'm maybe from... No, no, go ahead. People think they're not sure whether Wonder Island Circle was composed in Vienna or Paris. So what what I was gonna say was um and I'm treading on your toes now, but um, I was conducting the Mozart's Paris Symphony recently. You're not treading on my toes, Chris, because I can't say that I was conducting the Paris Symphony, <laughs> can I? You know, I don't it's remember the last piece of... I don't think I've ever conducted a piece by Mozart, so, you know... It's not the time yet. Hmm. I'm still young. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I always look at the context surrounding a piece whenever I'm conducting it. And the Paris Symphony he wrote whilst he was visiting Paris, uh, looking for work basically, and wrote it, you know, to put on a concert to kind of show off ah, to attract a kind of what, um, what number symphony is that? Do you remember? Oh, I can't remember. It's, it's like 32, 31. I don't know. I'll, oh, I'll okay. So re- reasonably late. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. He didn't get um, a job from it. They, you know, reasonably successful, but. He didn't get a job from it. Yeah. It's, I always think it's interesting when you look back at people like Mozart, for example, people who particularly sort of from the classical era, they're, they're looking for work, aren't they? A lot of them and, and quite often not getting it. Yeah, and, definitely know, in the case of Mozart. We're, we're now looking at thinking, you know, we're looking at one of the great geniuses of humankind. Yeah. Not getting work. It's insane. Um, um, it's symphony number 31. Okay. So yeah, the 15 languages, I don't know what they all are, but there must be, like you say, German, French, I assume English, I assume Italian as well. Uh, um, Prague, he lived in for a bit, right? Yeah, so maybe Czech. maybe Czechs got thrown in there. I don't know if it would be things like, I don't know, maybe he, maybe he was someone who, let's say, spoke, if he spoke French and Italian and could understand, say, Corsican, if he counted that, you know, which almost doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. Okay. Shall I tell you my favourite story about about Mozart. This is a bit apocryphal, okay? So again, people might want to correct this. Okay. You all know this story. But as I understand it, Mozart was visiting the Vatican, I think. Their their choir they were performing Allegri's Miserere. Okay. Lovely um, piece. Beautiful piece. And Mozart thought the same. Because afterwards, the story the story goes that he went to ask for the music. Now you'll know this, Chris, at the time, um the Catholic Church are very protective of its music and didn't want anyone else to to have it. So it would only be sung in places like the Vatican. So, you know, Mozart said, could I have a copy of the music? They said no. So Mozart said, okay, went home and wrote all the music down anyway. And that's nah, how people got copies of Algorithm Miserere. Incredible. You know, they're like... What I find amazing about that is you or I, Chris, could could perhaps write down a, a, a short four-bar phrase, right, if it was plays to us one note at a time, okay? I was just thinking that whilst you were telling the story. I was like, how much can I remember off the top of my head? Definitely mm. not the whole thing, even though it's repetitive, but yeah, yeah, a, few, yeah. a few bars. Imagine hearing it once. Yeah. And then and then writing it all down, all the parts at once. That's that's the sort of, but that's the level of genius we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, madness with with, uh, with Wolfie. So, in terms in terms of him, Chris Mozart himself, and there's not a lot much else to say. In terms, well, there is. Well, I say that there's loads to say. There's not much I want to say more, other than a few a few details about his life. So, for example, do you know um, do you know when he died? You were right about 1756. Uh, yeah. Is it like nine? No, because he was like 33. 
83 or something? The or older, 30, 35, I think. So 1791. Uh, I always think that's amazing because look at what he did and he died at 35. Absolutely insane, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, um, also, people often say he died in a pauper's grave, which isn't really true. Oh, is it not? Because that, that's that's what I thought. No, apparently that's that's really overstated. He, like he perhaps didn't have the sort of grand funeral that he probably should have done. Um, but I, it, you know, it wasn't a pauper's grave by by any means. It was just you know a little bit sad to see him him die the way he did. Um, My understanding was that you know from history books and Leo, his letters to his dad Leopold, yeah, mm. was that his money management maybe wasn't the best, so mm. he you know, have some success with an opera or whatever, get paid yeah. for it, and then very quickly kind of burn through it on, like, the finest clothes and things like that. Oh, I think that's definitely true, because he he loved that sort of thing. He also yeah. apparently, um, he had a, um, a very strange sense of humour um, in terms of it was quite childish. If I were to compare his humour to a friend of mine, Chris, um, I think you'd be right up there. Because he used really? to play like he used to play childish pranks on people, find it amusing, and many others didn't. <laughs> little, prank. Jake, little ing jokes for himself, for example. Um, <laughs> so some people in high society didn't enjoy that, and it, and maybe that's a sort of um, character that meant that he didn't always um, spend his money wisely, shall we say? Yeah. So he did. He um, he did have he did have lots of problems with money in general, but actually at the time of his his um, death it was it it actually improved a little bit we know that he he died from an illness uh people aren't always um unsure what that was uh, yeah apparently over a hundred causes of death have been suggested well, do you know do you know over a hundred yeah i don't know if i could name we're not going to do it now but i don't know if i could name over a hundred causes of death well I, I it was what was interesting is i didn't when i was thinking about this i thought i don't actually know how most i died um and poison it turns out, me, joking joking listen, that's the conspiracy theory isn't it good gag good gag almost certainly not true almost yeah. certainly not true go watch the play very good but yeah so he it wasn't a pauper's great it was a mo- it's been described as you know like a, a modest funeral for what he was in society obviously chris his requiem wasn't performed at his funeral do you know why i say obviously it's, it's not obvious unless you know the answer um, I I know a little bit about this. Didn't wasn't the requiem finished by one of his pupils? Yeah, yes, Susmaya. That's him. Yeah, because the requiem was uh, unfinished. In fact, lots of the requiem wrote, Mozart didn't write at all. His, his requiem was very very famous, of course, but massive parts of it weren't written by him. But what he had done is he'd started every movement. I think it was every movement anyway. Mm. So it became a little bit clear, you know, which way he was going with it. But it was finished by Sussmeyer, which is a reason it wasn't played at his funeral. But bonus points to you, Chris, if you can give me the name of a composer whose funeral it was played at. Well, I don't know this. I'm going to have a, a, a random guess. Go on, go for it. Um, oh, Brahms. No. Well, it might have been, actually, but it's wait, definitely wait, wait, played. Wait, 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 can, I, can I have another guess? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, Tchaikovsky was a big Mozart fan, wasn't he? Mm. So let's go, let's go Ch- try. Tchaikovsky famously said he loved Mozart, didn't he? But he was afraid of Beethoven, which I, I think I kind of know what he means. Um, no, this was Chopin. This is this is Frederick Chopin had a okay. Mozart's Requiem apparently at his funeral. I wasn't there. That's those are a few facts about Mozart. Okay, lovely. Which I think you know wonderfully interesting. Now you mentioned a few performances of Rondo alla Turca, Chris. Sure. We'd like to talk to us about any of them, and maybe talk to us a little bit about your your own version yourself. Uh, Lovely. So um, the first one that jumps to mind is um, I used to play this a lot busking. So Mm. when I was a music student. On the piano, Chris? No. um, Oh, all right. I used to play the flute and uh, my girlfriend at the time played the piano left hand on the cello. (laughs) So uh, Rondo alla Turca. Bit of a bit of a crowd pleaser. Mm, mm. Rip that out when you know we had a few people standing around watching. So that that was like the main thing because obviously it's a piano piece and um, I play a bit of piano, teach a bit of piano, but but my main instrument's the flute. So 
playing it on the flute. First thing is that. Uh, but second, and perhaps more importantly, mm. I remember playing it at a concert at uni that we have talked about in a previous podcast. We have talked about. And before you go any further, I yeah. wonder if you and I might be the only people to have played Rondo a la Turca on three different instruments. If, if Assuming you've played it on the piano. Yeah, yeah, I've played it on the piano. There we go. Go on, continue. <laughs> if, if you've not already heard this in one of our previous podcasts, which one was it? Um, worst musical moment. So I'm glad you brought this up again. Possibly. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> if you have heard it. Just in, in brief, um, at university, we uh, did a thing called Grade one a where you swap instruments with a friend or hopefully a friend mm. and uh, do Grade 1 very quickly, like three it's weeks. It's the charity, isn't like it? It's the charity. So you raise yeah. a bit of money. You say, Sponsored. oh, can you sponsor me for, you know, to learn Grade 1 on an instrument I've never played before? I've got to do it. In t- Is it two weeks you had? It wasn't long, was it? Yeah. And that's, you know, see if you can do it. Long and short of it, Chris, is that I learned the flute, didn't I, with you, and yeah. you learned the trombone. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, my, my flute teacher wasn't happy with that. I don't know if I told you this at the time. No. They, they said it was going to ruin my embouchure, and that, you know, after after grade one of them, I shouldn't really play the trombone again. You've never really hit the heights that you have either with the flute, have you, since then? People say people say it's because I don't play it very much. It people say happen, your, unfortunately. your LRSM aside, people say that you yeah, you went downhill a lot after that. <laughs> from from the trombone days. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we, we swapped instruments. Joe plays the trombone, I play the flute. We swapped instruments. And then we were a we were playing in a concert where they were evidently a bit short of material. Yeah. Where, I mean, how so, short of material do you have to be to get this to happen? But anyway. So we played uh, Rondo Alla Turca with me doing the piano right hand on the flute, all the you know, mm-hmm. last bits. Joe doing the nice left hand bomb, 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 bomb stuff on Lovely. the trombone. Yeah. But then in the major sections, the major who came up, sections. Who came up with a brilliant idea, Chris? Tell them who came up with a brilliant idea. I actually can't remember. You're looking confused. It was, obviously, it was you. Nice. But yeah, we, we would... Um, we we swapped instruments in in those sections, and I, yeah. I thought it was fun. I enjoyed doing it. <laughs> yeah, I thought it did. I thought it went really well. We'll dig out a recording. Oh, um, yeah, so is, is is that what you think of whenever you think of Rondo Alla Turca? Do you now think of that concert? How can I not think of that concert when anyone mentions Rondo Alla Turca? It's not. <laughs> it's one of those pieces that I think is so well known that um, you don't necessarily listen to it sort of the cuffs. You think, well, I know that. So it makes me think of that. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that maybe it will get overtaken by your version. I don't know about that, but have have you listened to my version then? I have, I have. Do, Any... you, want to, do you want to tell us anything about it? I, I guess the main thing was that um, I did it quite quickly. I did mm. that and Pacquiao Cannon in the, which is incidentally going to be our, our next podcast. So stay yeah, tuned make for a that. Note. Yeah. But yeah, I, I did that and Paco Canon in the same month. And I remember actually yeah. um, I spent quite a bit more time. I did them both quite quickly, but I spent more time on this one than Paco Balcano. I was like, oh, I'll just try and get them mm. done quickly. They're both quite famous. You know, people might, mm. might know them, people might like them. And then they both did quite well. Like this one did quite well. But then Paco Balcano has been the most popular thing I've done by, by such a long way. Like, I, I quite, find it quite funny because I spent more time on, on this one and just did Canon like really, really quickly. People know nothing, and that's it. You know, they haven't got a clue. That's the, uh, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. We'll, we'll play some of it in the outro. I was a big fan, actually, which might show a little bit of of my naivety with this style of music. But the way you sort of created your own motif with like the first half of the you did that and you repeated it, built yeah, it up nicely, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, it's just very, it's just very cool. I would, I would go listen to it, um, particularly. Chris, can I say that you can cut this out if you don't like it? Mm. I um, I think it's really good uh, music to exercise to. You know, if you're into listening to music whilst you you know go have a workout, I think they're particularly good for that. Which also a lot of classical pieces I find often aren't. But I think your tracks definitely are. Thanks, you know? appreciate that. The main thing I had a problem with initially when I was trying to make a remix of this was, was the, the chord sequence. Yeah, but because... Um, Did you consult well, anyone? You must have consulted a, a wise music mind. 
<laughs> I, I did ask you about it, to be fair. For you sure. did, didn't you? You did. I don't know if I got yeah. any help, but I, I asked you. <laughs> and um, the reason is because of the tonic major minor. So like we said earlier, the main sections are A minor and then A major. So mm. in dance music or pop music or whatever you want to call it, um, you would be in one key usually and use, let's say, four chords from that key. Mm. And tonic major minor, that kind of key change, that, that is mm. not one of those four chords, shall we say. Mm. Um, so initially, I did make it as an, an A minor section, an A major section, but mm. eventually I changed it so that the A minor section was actually F sharp minor, mm. so the relative minor of A major. And, and I, I think it works a lot better like that. Yeah, yeah, it's having, interesting. Having like, yeah. As a dance track, as in that version works better as a dance track. Like, not, no, no, I no, think no. That works better I than Mozart's version. You clearly think you're better than Mozart. Fine, okay. East <laughs> of the rain. Um, you know that is the headline. Chris better than Mozart. Um, I know exactly what you mean, and I think it does work better like that. Interesting, isn't it? How if it's played on the piano, you can't really imagine it being anything else other than going from tonic minor to tonic major. Mm. And yet, I remember what you're saying about the dance track and. It'd be interesting to see if people listen to it, if they notice that change, right? Which is, yeah, it works much, much better on the dance track by having it to go to the rose and minor, the F-sharp minor like that. Oh, cheers. Yeah. And then the, the other thing I changed was, a, I guess, a little bit more subtle. Um, I don't know if you picked up on it. Uh, you know, I, w- I would have done for sure, but tell me, tell me what you think <laughs> it is, and then I'll tell you, you know, I'll tell you nothing, if you're right. Nothing gets past your... No, yeah. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, right, so... The you know in the original the Mozart in the mm. A major section you've got the sort of spread chords. Mm, it's it's yeah. more like a like a spread up to the uh bass note. So you get bram bum 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 bram bum 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 that stuff. Yeah. So rather than put that in the bass line, I put grace notes in the melody instead. So instead of bum bum bum, it's bum bum bum. So I yes. it around. Nice, clever, clever. I think it's, I think it's very cool. Very cool. Go, go listen. Mm. Yeah, nice, nice. I'll put a link in the description. Yeah. Right, so um, now we've had a good long chat about Mozart and Rondo Alaturka. Looking at YouTube analytics, it does seem that, um, you know, we've we've had a few few listeners so far. Like, it's great. Happy with things so far. Uh, thank you very much. But we do lose most of our listeners at the start of the podcast. Going back to the Rachmaninoff, podcast which is the other piece we talked about so far the other composer we it, it took about nine minutes of just general waffle mm. um before we actually started talking about rack off so with this we thought you know we, we can't not have that waffle like i yeah. always enjoy chatting to you about music and stuff yeah so we'll, we'll 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 save the drivel till the end so so here we are if you've made it this far congratulations you're in the top 10% of listeners. It's like we can say what we want, Chris. No one's listening. We can literally say what we want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's We've perfect. By now. Yeah. Should we say, should, why don't we say, you know, we're not recording in a while. Why Why would we be recording today? You know? Because um, we, we've both got a little little day off, which is nice, isn't it? Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Um, Glorious. And, and you've, you've driven up to see me. What is it? 100 plus things. miles, probably? For about, it's, for about 100 yeah, miles. It's quite the round trip. Mm, yeah yeah and i just yeah, look great to record Appreciate in person it. right it's 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 nice to see you to chat with you and do it like that to that end what have you done well i, I had a last minute look at um because we were going to do the podcast so we're in separate rooms table, just, but... just tell them we're in separate rooms i've driven up to see you <laughs> you're in the bedroom and i'm in the spare room and that's what it is okay i might as well be sat in my own living room i've driven 150 miles to sit in your room on, on my own you know, it's great. It's lovely to be here. I suppose it's just a nice change of environment, isn't it? I'd, I'd say with like music technology, audio technology, I'd say like mm. I'm, I'm getting, getting, getting to know what I'm doing certainly mm. more than I yeah. used to. Yeah. With technology in general, just, just like <laughs> setting stuff up on a laptop, less so. So yeah. honestly, just trying to get um, my laptop to recognise two separate audio inputs at the same time. Yeah, it just, just wasn't worth the time. So here we are, separate rooms, doing it. Here we are. <laughs> Lovely stuff, you know. I might, I might see you in a minute in person if you're lucky. Yeah, maybe. Um, um, other drivel. Go on. little podcast fact for you. Yeah. 
I've been saving this one. Obviously, podcast, very popular format. Certainly yep. enjoy a good podcast to listen to myself. A little bit saturated, one might say. So good job That's what I was going to say. Mm. Uh, so here's a fact for you. If a podcast gets 100 listens in the first 30 days after it's streamed, mm. that podcast is in the top 50% most popular podcasts. Wow. How insane is that? That's mental. Which, which some of ours certainly have been. That's top half. That's great. We'll be looking at Europe next season. You but know. How, how staggering is that as a fact? Like just, just a, how many podcasts must be put out? It's worrying, isn't that, it? It's worrying. People that, like that us. You don't need that many listens relatively for it to be in the top half. Yeah. Like yeah. how many aren't getting? Yeah. 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 And so thank you very much for listening. Cheers. Think about what you've done to us. Put us in the top 50% of people, more or less. And then, then the other thing, just from analytics, because uh, yeah. ne- next time I want to read you off some funny things, but we'll save that Excellent. for the, the next one. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I mentioned to you recently that one of our podcasts got picked up by the YouTube algorithm yeah. more so than other ones. <laughs> so one of our podcasts has had about 16, 1700 listens on YouTube. <laughs> But it was it was a part B rendition of thing. It was like <laughs> worst things about classical music, I think it was. So that had quite a few listens. Nobody went back and listened to part A of those sixteen hundred people. <laughs> no point. No point. They've heard the best bits. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear part B. Let's hear part B. I don't understand how that stuff works. Maybe we should make more part Bs. <laughs> you know? That's that's the that's the takeaway here, maybe, right? Let's do more yeah. <laughs> Uh, nice one. En- enjoyed chatting about uh, about Mozart and Rondal Turkey there. Thanks for sharing that. Love your stuff. You're welcome. Enjoyable. And then uh, behind the scenes, we're going to take a quick break now and then go record Buckle Bell Cannon. We certainly are. Don't tell anyone. So we'll see you next time for a bit of Packle Bell. Packle Bell. Pack, pack all the bells and we'll see you then. Sure. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.